again, uh, you YouTubers, viewers of On the Barricades. This is Maria Terma, the co-host of the show On the Barricades. And this is the second video I'm recording while sitting in my car. I can't really say I'm driving because I'm right away. There is almost an endless queue here at the traffic light in Bucharest. This is not something unusual. Actually, this is something that we, people of Bucharest, have to deal with on a daily basis. As I told you, Bucharest is the worst place for drivers in the world. It was ranked that way a couple of years ago. And actually, this is very interesting because it happened to be so after the European Union prevented the government to regulate the, the market in a way that we had a very high, oh, this is also a hole in the pavement, something usual here in Romania and especially in Bucharest. So uh, the government wanted to regulate the market to prevent older vehicles from entering Romania. So uh, you were allowed to bring a car from Germany that was old, but then again, you had to pay a very big tax to to get your documents to make it legal to drive it here. So the Euro European Union prevented us from doing so. And a couple of, a couple of years ago, Bucharest was actually flooded with cars, with second-hand cars coming from Western Europe. And the traffic that was already very difficult and, and it was already very difficult to get by as a driver in Bucharest became uh, impossible. At the same time, investments in public transportation are very low. Actually, from my village, it would have taken me like 10 minutes to go to the central station in Bucharest, but unfortunately, there is no train to get me there. So. I'm bound to, to use my car to move from place to place. Uh, and of course, there is no ethical consumption and there is no way to save the planet on your own. I bought the smallest car possible. My car is very small. It consumes uh, very little fuel. And I intend to buy a hybrid one to consume even less. But <laughs> the main... The main transportation companies cannot rely on electrical vehicles and actually, actually the public transportation is the key to this. Not me thinking that I will buy an electric bicycle and I will save the planet like this. Not to mention that uh, cars and the pollution that comes from the cars is only a small problem. Small part of, of the bigger problem and there are polluters like the army and um, uh, agricultural sectors and uh, pesticides companies and all the rest but I'm trying to do my part and by doing my part I meant I bought a very small car that doesn't consume a lot of fuel that is actually very wise since the, the gasoline price almost doubled. I used to pay uh, about a euro per liter and now I have to pay almost double, almost two euros per liter just to move from place to place. Now, I read actually today some very interesting articles on Ukraine Ukraine uh, is a subject that I had to take a break from because Facebook blocked me for a very, very benign comment. I just said, commenting on a Romanian influencer's page and post saying that, oh, so you think that the ones who oppose starting World War III are stupid? Oh, good things that the pro-war ones are intelligent. And this this was considered bullying, if you can believe this. Now, it is very difficult to rely on for-profit pl platform 
ones that are mainly operated from the western part of the world to convey a critical message on what's going on in the war on, on Ukraine. But actually today I, wrote, I, I read on Left East, that is a very small uh, media platform operating mainly in Romania and in English, trying to offer critical analysis for Eastern European countries and of course we use English because uh, it's easier that way for because here we have a language barrier the Czech Republic the Czech is very different from the Hungarian language that is very different from the Romanian language that is also very different from the Bulgarian language so we're in a common denominator so we used English and it was extremely, extremely, I find it to be a valuable analysis on what's going on. First and foremost, Ukraine was uh, militarized and that meant a couple of things. It meant that mostly um, uh, women were first into positions and into jobs that were underpaid. Second, it meant that Ukraine, because uh, they have a lot of people who are fair hair and uh, have blue eyes, and uh, in the market of surrogacy, this is something very valuable. So the market of surrogacy exploded, and no matter how hard the companies try to say that the women of, of Ukraine do this out of their generosity it is poverty that uh, pushes them to, to this solution and um, of course this has very dramatic uh, consequences on the health of the women involved in this because uh, and they are not paid from the article and the statistics that were quoted um, they are paid like uh, Three hundred, four hundred dollars a month, and uh, fifteen thousand uh, dollars once the baby is delivered. But if something happens and the baby uh, is not healthy, then the baby is just rejected by the couple. I find this to be one of the most dehumanizing experiences. And while some leftists try to say that we should consider this labor I say okay we consider this labor but our aim as progressives is to take labor out of the for-profit circuit not to introduce other aspects of our lives into this and to transform everything including having babies into a capitalist uh, for-profit uh, mode of production so the idea would be to take sexuality, to take uh, reproduction out of this uh, for-profit uh, mode of production, not and even to take work and part of our work out of this uh, very, very narrow uh, way of thinking about our creative capacities in the world not to introduce everything in this. I mean, Richard Wolf, Richard Wolf gives the example of um, the family that doesn't run as a capitalist enterprise, meaning that you don't go to your mother and say, oh, I need this shirt ironed, and she says, oh, give me three dollars, right? This is not how you operate things into a family. Well, for some progressives, this is not okay, and they think that the true way to, to make things better for women is to transform domestic labor and sexual labor into labor, and not something you do out of your own generosity, but something you do to get paid for. And I think this is actually regressive. Because instead of pushing for taking work and creative capacities out of the production uh, cycle and taking those capacities out of this very narrow perspective, you work to get paid, how about having a, a basic income large enough that would, would 
make you choose your own profession, make you choose your own activity and give you a breathing space so that you're not forced to sell your labor power into the market. How about that? That would be a progressive move. Instead, some progressives want to make everything about our lives, including the surrogacy that in Ukraine has such dramatic consequences and implications into something productive and to be to introduce everything into this um, market-driven economy. Now, um, so these are my thoughts. I was quite surprised to see that I think there are very, very little articles written from a critical perspective about Ukraine and the gender dimension of what really meant for Ukraine to become a highly militarized country. It also meant that domestic violence, according to the statistics, uh, actually exploded. The statistic quoted in the article, I'm so sorry, I can't remember right now the, the, the name, uh, uh, but I will put the, and I will reference this very good article in the description uh, below, in the link to this video. So it was like 160% growth in domestic violence. Why? Because a lot of the military personnel was not helped in any way uh, psychologically so the family had to be the buffer had to be the the, the place where these people uh, came to heal their wounds actually like in every everywhere it, it is the same and it's actually the women that have to bear this tremendous cost of conflict and of constant war and also, what is interesting is that basically the military personnel is not to be uh, trialed and prosecuted in a civil court, meaning that they basically have some sort of immunity against uh, domestic violence. If a husband beat up his wife, then he has to be trialed and prosecuted in a separate court, a military court. And I don't understand. Uh, why uh, and uh, this is not I, I haven't checked this out but this is uh, what the article said about military personnel in Ukraine and you had in Ukraine surrogacy because Ukrainian women are so beautiful isn't it then you had um, domestic labor and all sorts of menial jobs uh, being done by Ukrainian women that were first into these positions because uh, it was no longer possible for them to uh, earn a decent wage in their country. So they had to go uh, and clean up the houses of uh, rich Westerners in Europe. It was also the domestic violence uh, and other things that uh, usually leftists do not take into consideration when they consider that Ukraine is this brave country fighting a European war. You bet it is, but it's been fighting this European, um, not war, but this war, this neoliberal war on women for quite a while. For quite a while, it is not only then, not only now, with the cocktail Molotovs that the Ukrainian women are fighting to support the white Europe. But they've been doing this for quite a while now. And I think uh, it is important to have this, uh, this complex analysis of the situation and refrain from, um, from very simplistic narratives. And also, what is also very interesting here is, of course, the double standard that it was also mentioned in, in the article. I, I think it is the first, I'm pretty sure there were others, but I think this is the first article written by a Ukrainian feminist that I truly enjoyed. She confessed, she, it took her weeks to write it, but the result is exceptional. Um, 
and she speaks there uh, about all these things related to the war in Ukraine. It was actually a gendered war and a class war and uh, it was not to the benefit of the Ukrainian people and she also speaks not many Ukrainians have the courage to speak about this because the situation is in their advantage now but she she speaks against this double standards regarding migrants and she says you are praising the Ukrainian women for building cocktails, uh, molotovs and trying to fight the Russian invasions, but you don't praise Palestinians, you don't praise Syrians and other uh, um, like the Afghani people or the Iraqi. These are second-hand citizens when compared to the Ukrainians. And she tackles also this, this very troubling uh, double standard in terms of migrants and how those who have a lighter skin and uh, fair hair are welcomed, while the Roma community, we even had an incident here in Bucharest, while the Roma community was somehow excluded and uh, treated disrespectfully, not to mention and to her credit, uh, the author of the article also mentions this, how Poland, just a couple of months ago, was so keen to reject migrants coming from Belarus, while now, and it was a couple of thousands of migrants, it was not like uh, something uh, huge, but now they are receiving millions of Ukrainians. And just to see how irrational our world is and how a fair hair and blue eyes mean that you are still considered a superior human being. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how deeply racist and irrational, irrational we are in evaluating uh, other human beings and how incapable we are of evaluating intellectual, moral uh, traits and uh, judging the book by the cover, judging the, the, the person by the skin. It is unbelievable. And to her credit, the author mentions this and, and it was a very, very nice um, and interesting uh, interesting experience to finally see that um, somebody from Ukraine discusses it. It's important to be somebody from Ukraine because otherwise it seems like uh, I'm sitting here in my nice car, of course, in this horrible traffic, but nevertheless in a very comfortable position trying to uh, lecture the Ukrainians. Uh, and. Um, I simply stopped. I stopped discussing this war and discussing its implications because I actually was lectured by somebody who claims to be a leftist to buy a gun. I mean, it is exactly like uh, the spokesperson for the, the pro-gun lobby in the United States said that uh, if women want to be defended, it, the idea is not to stop conflict uh, shootings and uh, the sale of uh, weapons, but to arm women. Of course, probably the next step would be to arm children, uh, because we in the United States we witness mass shootings in the schools, so the logical conclusion is arm children, right? Arm women, arm children. So after I was lectured and after I had people actually from the university telling me that I'm somehow enabling Putin. <laughs> uh, I find this so bizarre and, and ridiculous. I said, okay, this is not the time to discuss rationally with these people. I took a, a voluntary break from, from Facebook and um, I use this platform that still offers a little bit more room to share my thoughts. So read the article, I'm going to definitely put it in the, uh, in the link below.